You can't really rely on what the game tells you. This is going to be a bit of a complicated topic, but I'll try to make it as easy to understand as possible and give some examples. First, some disclaimers. Very important. This is the result of some extensive data mining, calculation and testing from the Reddit users RamZN2, Mike10D, Baron Tiberius and Luna Inverse. All the credits for finding these things go to them, and you'll find a link to the original post in the description. Secondly, these results were obtained as of the second dev server. They are subject to change and may indeed yet change between now and the release of the patch. Finally, this isn't intended to rile up the community or spark out cries of bias. It's purely informative to show you how and why it works. Alright, with the disclaimers out of the way, we are going to go in depth on the actual performance of the composite armor of the M1 Abrams, the T64B and the Challenger 1 against kinetic energy projectiles. The Leopard 2K is not going to be considered here simply because the armor isn't really worth talking about. Let's start off with the M1 Abrams, since there are a couple of peculiarities with how its armor is coded into the game. Warning! Numbers. Lots of them. We are going to be rounding some of the numbers for ease of understanding. If you want the actual accurate values down to the millesimal points, refer to the Reddit post in the description down below. Right, the Abrams composite armor consists of three layers. At the front is a 31.75mm thick burster plate made of modern rolled homogeneous armor, behind which is a 600mm thick array of non-explosive reactive armor, finally ending in a backing plate with a thickness of 101mm. Now, it's important to understand that each of these plates and materials has its own multiplier to determine the actual effective thickness. For example, regular homogeneous armor, for example, regular rolled homogeneous armor has a 1 times multiplier, meaning that however thick the plate is, it is also the actual thickness when calculating the armor protection. In comparison, and if I recall correctly, cast homogeneous armor, for example, has a 0.95 times multiplier meaning that a 100mm thick plate of CHA only actually counts for 95mm of actual armor. I'm just mentioning this because of the modifier on the uh, frontal modern RHA plates. Those 31.75mm have a multiplier of 1.01 times, giving them an actual thickness of roughly 32mm. That said, the non-explosive reactive armor array and the back plate have their own unique modifiers. For starters, the Nera array actually has zero actual effectiveness against kinetic energy. None. Nada. It only works against chemical energy, like heat shells. The actual kinetic energy protection comes from the multiplier on the back plate. For the turret armor, this plate has a 2.69 times multiplier, whilst the hull has a 1.96 times multiplier. And, yes, you guessed correctly, this does make the hull armor weaker against kinetic energy projectiles than the turret. Doing the maths, and keep in mind that the turret plates have different angles as well as accounting for the slope of each plate, this results in the following total line of sight thicknesses of each plate when viewed directly from the front. The lower frontal plate offers roughly 303mm of kinetic energy protection. The third plate to the right offers roughly 427mm of KE protection and the plate to the left offers roughly 397mm of, you guessed it, kinetic energy protection. But there is a catch. Usually, the more you would angle the plates, the more effective armor you would obtain. Except for the M1 Abrams, that is only the case up to a certain limit. You see, the back plates have an associated snippet of code called Armor Effective Thickness Max. This limits the maximum protection that plate can provide. To put this in context, the back plate on the third composite has a maximum effective thickness limit of 360mm. Meaning that no matter how much you angle that plate, it is going to cap out at that value. The same thing happens for the hull plate, which has a maximum effective thickness limit of 327mm. But what does that mean? Well, doing the calculations, no matter the angle you present, the turret plates are going to offer no more than roughly 405mm of armor, and the hull plate is going to offer no more than roughly 369mm of armor. Let's go back to the total effective thicknesses we've shown earlier. Directly from the front, the hull is still going to be, to be providing the same 303mm of protection. And the turret plate on the left is still going to be providing 397mm as well. The plate on the right, however, is no longer providing 427mm, but is instead capping out at 405mm. 
And this doesn't increase regardless of angle. The turret plates are always going to offer at best around 400mm, whilst the hull offers at best around 370mm of kinetic energy protection. These are just the maximum values of course. If you present the plates completely flat, the turret only offers 306mm and the hull only 232 We're going to see what that actually means for the Abrams protection against the various shells in a bit. First let's also go quickly over the armor values for the T-64B and the Challenger 1, directly from the front. Keep in mind, these are not affected by the Abrams Max limit to angling effectiveness. The T-64B has a rather complicated turret. To keep it simple, the direct front with composite offers roughly 330mm of protection against kinetic energy, with 150mm weak spots right next to the gun. You should really be able to penetrate this with most APFSDS shells in the game. The upper frontal plate offers roughly 156mm flat, but is set at a 68 degree angle for an effective thickness of 417mm. The more you can reduce that angle, like by shooting at it from above for example, the easier it becomes to penetrate the upper frontal plate. Keep in mind that the lower frontal plate does not have composite armor and as such is a weak spot, as well as there being a hole in the composite armor around the area of the driver's viewport, making it yet another weak spot that can be penetrated even by the Leopard's A1A1 new APFSDS shell. Finally, onto the Challenger 1. The upper frontal plate protected by composite armor offers roughly 339mm of protection, although there are massive weak spots in the form of the driver's hatch and the lower frontal plate, which have no composite and can even be penetrated by some T1 and 2 tanks. The turret is divided into two plates. The plate to the left, when viewed from the front, offers roughly 199mm flat for a total of 358mm accounting for the angle. The plate to the right offers roughly 209mm flat for a total of 388mm accounting for the angle. Just like with the Abrams, the turret isn't symmetrical. Also to note is a rather flat armor plate at the base of the turret cheeks, which only offers around 260mm and as such is a weak spot. So, to summarize what we know so far, the Abrams has very little in terms of major weak spots and offers 303mm of hull armor and roughly 400mm of turret armor. The T-64B has a couple of major weak spots, offering around 330mm on the turret front and 417mm on the upper frontal plate. The Challenger has major weak spots, both on the hull and the turret, and offers around 358mm on the turret left, 388mm on the turret right and 339mm on the upper frontal plate. Overall, the M1 has the best all-around protection against lower tier vehicles due to not having obvious easy weak spots. But it does offer a bigger target to top tier shells than the T64B does, with its nearly invulnerable upper frontal plate. The Challenger is definitely the worst of the bunch in terms of armor protection. Now, you might already be quite confused by everything we just went through, but there's one final thing. This is the graph that represents which kinetic shells from various tanks can penetrate which of the new MBTs in which places. Alright, this looks very confusing, so let's explain it with the simpler graphs sent to me by Baron Tiberius. Special thanks to him once again. These graphs represent the penetration of various shells adjusted for line of sight at the distance of 100 meters according for their slope modifiers as found in the game's code. The points represent the armor values of the components of the MBTs we just talked about. Simply put, if a line crosses to the right of a point, it means it should penetrated. I say should because it is important to note that there is some RNG to this. Any shell in the game rolls between negative 10% to plus 10% of its indicated penetration value when fired. For example, this means that a shell with 400mm of penetration can have anywhere between 360 to 440mm of actual penetration upon impact. This can result in some of the shells passing closely to the left of a point on the graph, having a lucky roll and being able to go through regardless, whilst shells that are to the right of a point and as such that should be able to go through, having an unlucky roll and failing to penetrate. Also, please note that the turret right and turret left on the graph are from the viewpoint of the tank, so just flip those around uh, if you're imagining the tank from the front. Finally, the points for Abrams third right and Abrams third left represent what the armor values would be without the maximum limit we've talked about earlier. Instead, the Abrams third effective zone is what you should be looking at. 
Let's start off with the Challenges gun then. It gets two choices of APF SDS, the L23 and the upgraded L23A1 shells. As you can see by the graph, both shells can easily go through the Abrams hull and the Challenger's own hull. The L23 may also go through the Abrams turret, although it may bounce with an unlucky RNG. It should always fail to penetrate the T64B's hull. The upgraded L23A1, on the other hand, is almost guaranteed to go through the Abrams turret and even the Challenger's own turret, but does rely on a lucky RNG roll to go through the T64B's upper frontal plate. Next up, some of the German guns, with the Leopard 2K, the Kampfpanzer 70 and the Leopard A1A1's APF SDS rounds. Again, all three shells should easily go through the unangled hulls of the Abrams and the Challenger. The turrets are mostly going to deflect the Leopard 1 and the Kampfpanzer 70, although the former might actually have a lucky RNG penetration on the Abrams turret and on one of the Challenger turret side. The Leopard 2 case shell should in most cases go right through the Abrams turrets, with your chances on the Challenger depending on which side you shoot. In most cases and with any of the shells, you will want to shoot at the left side when facing one from the front. That's where the armor is weakest. None of these shells should pen the T-64B's hull. Moving on to the Abrams shell selection with an additional bonus. The dotted line represents the depleted uranium M833 shell that is found in the game files and is a good representation of why it isn't currently available on the M1. It would just lol pen everything. Once again, both shells should deal easily with the Abrams and the Challenger's hulls. But that's it for the stock shell. The upgraded shell should be able to go through the Abrams own turret in most cases and just like with the Leopard 2K is likely to pen the left side of the Challenger's turret, but will likely bounce off of the right side. And, once again, none of the available shells penetrates the T-64B's hull. Next we have graphs for the T-95E1 and the AMX-30's APFSDS shells. The T-95 might be able to go through the Abrams hull, but is likely to fail against everything else. The AMX-30's shell can go through the hulls of the Abrams and the Challenger, but has pretty much no chance against anything else. Let's try some Soviet shells. T-55A, Object 120 and both APF SDS shells from the T-64A. The T-55A is pretty much useless here. The Object 120 is actually the best of the bunch, having a 50-50 chance of going through the Abrams turret, a good chance of going through either turret side of the Challenger and pretty much a guaranteed penetration on the hulls of either tank. It even has a small chance to go through the T-64B's upper frontal plate given enough luck. The T-64A is peculiar here. You have a shell with lower flat pen but better performance on slopes and one with higher base penetration but worse performance against angles. The 3 bm 9 shell goes right through the hulls of the Abrams and the Challengers, but fails against anything else. The 3 bm 12 on the other hand, struggles even against the hulls, but may in some extreme cases RNG roll through the Abrams turrets. In most cases, you will want to carry the 3 bm 9 over the 3 bm 12 the T-62 has a similar situation to the T-64A. The shell with the lower flat pan edge should perform better against the hulls of the US and UK tanks than the one with the higher base pan. Finally, the T-64B itself. The stock shell should have no problem dealing with the hulls of both of its opponents, as well as the Abrams turret. It will struggle with the Challenger's turret, however. The upgraded shell somewhat fixes that being able to go through even the Challenger's strongest turret size in the majority of cases. To conclude then, most of the tanks shown can go through the Abrams hull, especially fired at from below. Many will struggle with the turrets of both the Abrams and the Challenger. None can go through the T-64B's upper frontal plate reliably with kinetic energy. Do remember that all of this is at 100 meters. The shell lines are going to creep further left the farther away you are firing from. And finally, after over 2200 words in a script that was supposed to make this simpler and easier to understand, that is everything you need to know about the armor of the new MBTs coming in patch 1.77. To conclude this video, I do want to give my own subjective ranking from worst to best of the four main stars of this patch. Given everything we know and the time I've spent with each of these tanks on the dev server. The last place sadly has to go to the Challenger 1. Both of its APF SDS shells are very capable against the Abrams and it does possess stronger turret armor than the Abrams against most shells, at least on the right side when viewed from the front. 
However, with its numerous and huge weak spots, the poor mobility compared to the competition, and the possibly stocked AP dash shell that was still present on the second dev server, the drawbacks are just too big. If the challenger isn't camping hull down from the back of the map somewhere, it is very easy to take down by any tank. And the combination of that and the mobility means it isn't as effective at capturing points and playing the objective, which results in which results in making it much harder to get spawn points, whilst also increasing the chance to die early. Third place goes to the Leopard 2K, but honestly you might just as well share second place with the next tank. What the Leopard 2K lacks in armor, it makes up for in mobility and firepower, being the only tank that can easily penetrate the TC4B anywhere with its stock shell. And in case you face A-Rooms and Challengers, you just switch over to APFSDS to easily deal with them too. It also enjoys better survivability than the Kampfpanzer 70, having one more crewmate and being pretty spaced out. The only worry I have is the matchups. If Germany and Russia get teamed together against the US and UK as they usually do, the Stock Leopard 2K's HFS shell will struggle against the A-Rooms from the front. But once you have access to both shells, this is a very capable tank. Second place goes to, and this might surprise you, the T-64B. It is an overall great tank, having nearly invulnerable to kinetic energy shells, large upper frontal plate, a stock shell that is already capable of dealing with all of its opposition, with the upper shell only making it even easier, and good off-road mobility and an added heavy machine gun compared to the T-64A. It does however have major drawbacks too, like multiple weak spots from the front, a very cramped crew that results in a majority of one-shot deaths on penetrating hits, and a horrible reverse speed of 4 km per hour. You might say that the Leopard 2K is superior to the T-64B in a 1 vs 1 fight, but the T-64B is superior to everything else. Being a flat upgrade to the T-64A, it's bound to be a great tank. And finally, my personal contender for best tank of the patch goes to the M1 Abrams. It combines a good balance of armor, mobility and firepower. It really is a jack of all trades. The extreme mobility means it can almost keep up with Leopard 2Ks and give it the ability to quickly capture points and change positions. Its armor is very good and offers no obvious weak spots, really only being vulnerable to the other top tier MBTs being introduced, but very strong against lower tiered tanks. And whilst it does technically have the weakest gun, all of its opposition has very obvious weak spots that you can easily abuse. On top of that, you also have amazing survivability, with ammo racks and fuel tank explosions essentially doing nothing to you and your crew being quite spaced out. It's really hard to one-shot an Abrams, and it's going to be even harder to deal with multiples of them playing together. The only thing that should really worry you is the T-64B, since it very effectively negates your armor, but even then you can easily abuse its weaknesses. This is likely going to be my go-to tank once the patch drops. But it is about time we end this. Once again, I want to give special thanks to RamZN2, Mike10D, Baron Tiberius, and Luna Inverse for their work and for allowing me to use their data. You should really send these guys some good messages. Without them, the community would have never known about any of these things. Patch 1.77 is rumored to drop on Tuesday, the 13th of March, so I might even not be able to finish this video in time before it goes live. But once again, I do want to mention that these stats are from the second dev server. There might have been changes since then, so don't take this as gospel. For all I know, Gaijin completely revamped all of the armor profiles and this information is going to be dead on release. You'll have to test things out for yourself to confirm that. But if changes are made and if I catch them in time, I will update you in the respective reviews for the new vehicles. But in any case, lads, hopefully you have enjoyed this video. And as always, my name is Mike is Boom, and thank you for watching. You can lift your head up to the sky, take a deeper breath and give it time. You can walk the path among the lines with your shattered frame of mind. There is that you could always stay. We can wait right here and play until somehow you can find.